Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I am your host, Mark Verdi, the content marketing expert, bringing you three new episodes each week where I and top-level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success listeners. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. We have so many different things that we want to be doing within our businesses, within our lives, and there is a way for us to do all these different things that we want to do. We're going to talk a little bit about that in today's episode. So today's guest, he has done so many different things. He's uh, founded a tech startup, which has gone on to make a lot of money. He's been a New York City actor. He also has a sport academy that he created, which he actually sold to Nike. And now he operates a family construction company, Reynolds Brothers Exteriors, with his two brothers. And the Reynolds Brothers Exteriors prize themselves in offering uh, their customers the best rainwater management systems on the market today. So again, we have someone who, a tech startup, New York City, actor, uh, be able to sell a company to Nike, a lot of different things happening. So who is this guy? Well, today's guest for episode 278 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Sean Reynolds. Sean, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Great having you here. Thanks so much for having me on board there, Mark. Sean, I'm really happy to have you on the show because I feel like a lot of people, they have different ideas for where they want to branch out, but maybe they don't know which order to take it. Maybe they don't know which ones are more important. So I'm sure this episode is going to provide a lot of value to people. Before we get started, uh, can you talk about a little bit about how you got the entrepreneurial itch and what led you to Reynolds Brothers Exteriors, where you are today? Well, um, I think I would all lead back to my parents. Uh, my dad had me doing door-to-door uh, 50-50 hockey pools when I was a kid back home here in Canada. And uh, it, I guess, taught me not to be shy, not to be afraid to put myself out there and, and be afraid to, I guess, sell. Um, and then from there, it really was just following your passion. I've never felt like, you know, if you're – if you're really passionate about something, it doesn't feel like you're selling. You're just telling people something that you really believe in. Um, you know, I've had so many different iterations to what I've done. Um, you know, my parents, obviously my friends around me, um, getting to where I am today, you know, everybody talks about success being this really specific line, but for me, it's, it's a real squiggly line, a lot of back and forth things that were successes, things that were challenges and, um, getting the Reynolds brothers went through a lot of other businesses and, um, I don't know, I'm really happy to be here. It's a, it's a good place to be working with my brothers, my family. And I really like the idea of a family business, uh, something that we talked a little about during the, uh, pre-conversation before we actually started recording. But, uh, can you talk a little bit about that family business? Uh, how it is like working with your brothers and, um, uh, being able to strike that professional relationship while also having the family relationship as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, everybody tells you not to work with family or with friends, but truthfully, my experience has been the total opposite. Working with my brothers, you know, you know people that will have your back. Uh, you know people that you can trust. And truthfully, if an extra five dollars or whatever amount of dollars goes in somebody else's pocket within the business, for me, it's it's a win. Um, there are challenges, obviously, those things where maybe when you grew up, somebody you felt like somebody was a little bit more controlling or bossy. Those things can still come into play. But as you get older, you start hopefully learning where your successes and your challenges lie in your personality and your work ethic. And it doesn't mean that we don't, you know, have little issues here and there. But for the most part, it's 98 percent a great thing work with them. And there's that 2% of the time that I, I've had businesses that aren't family businesses and you still run that baloney uh, 2% of the time, if not more so. 
So um, I think if you have the right family and you have the right dan- dynamic and right relationship, you can make it happen family, friend-wise. It's, it's just getting people around you that, that have a passion and a belief and treat the company like their own every day of the week. And I wanted to point that out because I know some people may be thinking about a family business and you've got people who say never do it. I like to hear the other side of the conversation where, hey, this is really working out. This is something that uh, we're all growing together. We're all earning together. So there's a lot of potential for a family business. But going back, I mean, like I mentioned, all those things that you've been able to do, some people think they had to just like uh, be narrowly focused on like one or two things. And I mean, you've branched out, but... I'm wondering, um, did that branch out happen like um, all at the same time or did it feel a little more gradual? What would your advice be for someone who's like wants to branch out but isn't sure, do I narrowly focus on one thing or do I try all these, uh, a few key things? Well, you know, it's not like I plan to do 10,000 things. The the truth is I, you only get a certain amount of spins around this, this planet. And for me, um, I have a lot of different passions. So, you know, sometimes it's me just wanting to try something new at the same point in time. There's, it's almost like growing plants. You start, see certain things come into fruition and you say, Oh wow, that's really having some legs to it. And you start chasing that a little bit, but the truth is you could do five or six things sort of half-assed or you can do two things really well. So you have to make sure that you have processes in place that are going to make sure that each thing is moving forward and there's a lot to be said for, for luck and timing. You know, you, you can't plan for luck and timing. That stuff just happens. So the things I've been most passionate about, obviously, I've worked the hardest at. Me being an actor, I worked as hard as you can ever imagine. I, I had my, my most success with my businesses than I did with my acting because I had a lot less control. With my acting, I had to have somebody else tell me I could do something. But with your own businesses, you really decide if you really want to work as hard as you want and you convince people out there that what you're selling is worthwhile, then you can make that happen. But when you're beholden to somebody else to decide, well, oh, you can audition for this. Oh, this agent will take you on. This cash director will see you. There's so many gatekeepers along the way. Whereas if you have a great product and you can convince people that you're the person to deliver, then there really is no in your way. It's you and the client. So, um, Follow that passion. That being said, my passion is not always led to my greatest successes. It's it's sometimes it sometimes hindered me because sometimes when you're so passionate about something, every move feels that it means so so much. Whereas with maybe owning a different company, a technology company or sports cam company, there's less riding on every decision. You can be a little bit more relaxed, and being relaxed is a good thing. It's it's. You know, you call that girl and if everything is on the line that you get that date, then it it can make you maybe not as not your best self in that moment. And it's interesting you mentioned that um, uh, stress factor where if I mean, in some cases, you're really stressed. In other cases, you're really relaxed all about the mindset that you take when you're approaching these things. But I mean, I feel like that would apply to a lot of people that where I mean, you've got so many different things that are happening around you that you're responsible for, but you know, like there's just a limited time in the day. So how can we avoid getting stressed out? Because I feel like this is a key point for anyone who has a job and is doing a side hustle or anyone who wants to pursue multiple passions. Truthfully, I feel I'm at a place where things are going great, but there are days of the week where I feel totally stressed where things are just overwhelming. Where my business is going so well, the, the calls are just coming and you can't keep up with it. And it's, um, there's this thing, there's, there's two types of stress. There's distress, which is a bad stress. And there's use stress, which is, you know, a stress of having too many auditions or having too many clients calling you or, you know, having so much money that everybody's, you know, asking for a handout. So there's a good kind of stress and I call it drowning in chocolate. I get <laughs> so many calls. I love chocolate, but there can be a lot of it sometimes. So, um, you have to have processes in place. If you have a to-do list, which is just one long list, or if you're not utilizing people around you in which to delegate things, um, our business gets so successful 
And then you get in a mindset, well, why do I have to be the person to make every phone call or do every email or go out and, and do every meeting? Well, there are people around you that can do that. And it took me a long while to realize that. I remember with my sports camp, camps academies, it started off with myself and six, six kids on a tennis court. And by the end, when I sold it to Nike sports camps, it was over 2,000 kids and 50 instructors. And I had to learn that there had to be a coordinator, a coordinator at every location. I had to learn that I didn't have to talk to every parent. And you have to trust that the people around you can do the job as well as you. Sometimes that doesn't always happen and you have to learn that. Um, but if you're trying to have every touch point, then you, you, you're not going to be successful. You know, you, you have to trust there's people around you that are going to do, you know, if they can do 80% as, as good of a job as you, um, and you can get more done and the client will benefit in the end, then you have to be willing to maybe lose that little bit of, you know, uh, you know, shaking palms with every person or making every phone call because it's going to new, go new. It's not going to do you any good and it's not going to do the business any good. So have trust in that and have faith that it's going to come together and that you're important, but not as important as you think you are sometimes. I totally agree. I mean, like Sean hit on a really key point, which is if you want to be able to pursue multiple passions or even just if you're focused on one thing, really be able to grow that. Um, and you got to reach a point where eventually you have people who can help you with various tasks, like taking in some of the calls, uh, helping you edit your podcast or write show notes. I mean, you got to eventually hand off tasks to other people, but it's something that a lot of people are so reluctant to do. Sean mentioned that trust factor being uh, something very big that, I mean, I feel like that's the biggest hurdle people have when it comes to delegating. And Sean, I'm wondering if you could share with us your experiences a little deeper about uh, overcoming that uh, trust barrier where uh, now you're able to uh, trust people to the point where you can say, okay, this is something that I normally did that was important, uh, but I believe you can do this. Uh, I, I trust in your ability to do this. So when I first opened my second location for my sports academies, before that point in time, I was there every single morning saying hi to every single parent. And at one point in time, I had to open a second location. I had to trust that the person that was running that location was going to be the person. I was on the phone with them all day, touching base, touching base, which was taking me away from the new location I was opening. So it really was a leap of faith. And that doesn't say that I haven't hired people along the way where I've had challenges or I've had to let them go or they've been the total wrong person. You're going to make those mistakes. And I'll tell you, HR and hiring is the biggest challenge you, you think every person puts their best foot forward. It's like a first date. They tell you everything you want to hear. They're the right person. And there are those mistakes along the way. You're, you're going to make mistakes and you just have to be okay with that. And there's that thing of, you know, fail quickly, quit, quit quickly. And by the time you think you have to let somebody go, usually that means that a few weeks before, a few months before you should have let that person go. So those little clues you're getting along the way of maybe that person being the right person, being the wrong person, maybe giving them more responsibility, less responsibility. You have to, at least for me, trust my gut, talk to people around you that have proven themselves and, and have treated the company like their own. Um, and, and along the way you are going to make mistakes. You're going to learn from it. And I don't care if you're Richard Branson or Mark Cuban, trust me, those guys have made mistakes and they're still making mistakes to this day. And they're figuring out anybody who acts like they have it all together, they're full of it. And I mean, there are certain, like, as we go through life, they're just like different things, like different challenges we face. And when it comes to that level of trust also, uh, like you have these different scenarios that happen. It is part of life where, I mean, when you hire people, you're going to have to fire people. That's just part of it. And for some people, firing is really hard because uh, you develop a relationship with the person or you understand what you're providing, but you do have to make that decision to fire someone if that's uh, that person's not helping you uh, with your business. So something really interesting there for people to think about as they consider delegating. Uh, but earlier you were mentioning the two kinds of stresses. One would be distress. Uh, the bad one, the other would be, as you beautifully described, drowning in chocolate. So I feel like everyone knows what it means to be distressed. 
Because I feel like to get to that point where you're drowning in chocolate, you have to have distress to get there. Uh, so how can we make that leap where we're no longer distressed, but when any stress hits us, it's that uh, chocolate analogy? Well, you know, the distress part for me took when I was building my business. And obviously the use stress or the drowning, drowning in chocolate is obviously people love what you're doing. And you're just trying to keep your head above water. For me, the delegating part is the part that you have to sort of get your head around. Um, and there are so many tools out there nowadays. You've got, you know, websites like Indeed and Workopolis and things like that. You, you could be posting things on Facebook where we, we were just looking for somebody to do estimating for our company. And the perfect person that we found for it is somebody who's retired, you know, because with this role, it's it's somewhat sporadic and it can sort of come and go depending on the season. And we want somebody who has a really flexible schedule and likes a flexible schedule. So I just went on Facebook and I just said, hey, we're looking for somebody with this sort of, you know, in this part, you know, in this place in their life and um, put it out there. And Facebook was the answer. We have ended up finding the person through that. So a lot of times you're in that forest and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm over my head. I'm over my head and I don't have to do and I can't handle the phone calls. And you literally have to turn off the phone, put away all these things you need to do and take a moment and go, okay, how do I figure this out? Or if you can't figure it out, I've always had an amazing board of advisors around me. So when I had the sports camps academies, when I had a technology company, I had people around me who maybe weren't even in the same industry as I was, but they'd forgotten more about business than I knew. So I would do phone calls with them or emails and say, listen, this is a challenge I have. And a lot of times they know just because they've run into this problem so many times and they've made that mistake that they can come to that conclusion or that answer so much quicker than me going through it. So stand on the shoulders of other people who have already gone through this. Um, I get a lot of people that call me to do, to, they want me to consult with them. And the thing is, it's again, am I the smartest guy in the room? No, I've been through this a few times. I've owned a lot of different business, a lot of different iterations. And obviously, you know, I've, I've had some successes, but everybody knows you learn a lot from the, the mistakes and the challenges. You remember those tests that you got really killed on a lot more than the tests where you aced it at, at high school or university, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it is interesting. You mentioned that um, we remember our mistakes more often than we remember our successes. And um, I feel like, yes, like we learn from our mistakes. We should also remember our successes more because uh, if you're like climbing a mountain, most people look at what they have left uh, rather than looking down and seeing what they've already accomplished. So uh, we definitely remember our failures a lot more than our successes, but we should uh, also make it a point to remember our successes and acknowledge ourselves for what we have been able to do. And uh, one of the things that I do want to ask you is, I mean, you've done all these different things. Um, you've been around a lot of people. You've got that board. And I mean, that masterminding is really powerful, something I recommend everyone do. But going back to uh, what I was thinking, I'm wondering if you could share with us, what do you believe holds most people back from reaching their full potential? I think that a lot of people look at what, how's that saying go, you know, you even eat an elephant one bite at a time. They look at this big elephant and they're like, how the hell am I going to be able to do this? Right. Instead of, you know, you eat an elephant or you eat a piece of fish, it's one bite at a time. Okay. So you get up in the morning. What are the, what are the three things you need to do today? Get those three things done. And if you're doing those three things every single day, but if your job is like, I want to get my company acquired by Google, how, how do you even get your head around that? Like a lot of times you can't even, like for you to make that happen, maybe you can mastermind that. But truthfully, it's how do I make my, my business better? And then you go back further. Okay, how do I make my company better today? How, what can I do in this moment? And if you don't have a plan, for me, I'm a guy who has a list of to-dos as long as my arm, but I came up with, well, I found this thing. I don't know where I found this. I found this on a podcast a bunch of years ago, and it was called the um, Eisenhower Matrix. And what it is, is you take 
your most important items and you put it in one list and it has to get done right away. And then you take your next list and it's the most important items, but they don't have to get done right away. And then you take your items that are maybe a little less important. And then the items that are things you'd love to do, but not that important. And that takes my list instead of having 40 items on a list. And I'm like, how am I going to get this ever accomplished? It breaks me down to four different areas and it really puts in perspective of what's most important to me. And I found that with me, having a really long to do list is stressful. But if I look at this and I go, well, there's 10 things that are on my now to do right now list. Well, am I going to be able to accomplish all 10 of those things today? Well, then I have to go back to what I said to you before is, well, who can help me delegate? Like who can I delegate this to, to help this get done? What can I maybe move off this list? And you know what? I can accomplish those five things today. And with that, if you're putting one foot in front of your, of the other every day, and here's the thing, as much as I've had successes and I've had challenges, I've run my company from a hospital bed. You know, I have Crohn's disease um, and that's a debilitating disease. I've had surgeries for that. I've been on medication. I'm on medication. I was in the hospital eight months ago. I ran my company from a hospital bed. I had an IV in my arm and I had to do phone calls. There was one day my brothers were up to the eyeballs and they needed help. I made phone calls from a hospital bed. It's just the way you do it. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, people will listen to that and maybe think, wow, it's a little extreme taking calls on the hospital bed. But I mean, like, um, if you're able to do something like that, then it's very obvious the amount of dedication you have towards uh, what you're doing. And you need to have that level of dedication. And if you're able to do it during those spots, uh, then it's easier to just be productive and be dedicated all the time. And uh, going back to the Eisenhower. And, and, and not sorry, to inter interrupt it. you there for a second, Mark. Think of every person listening right now who doesn't have this. And not to diminish anybody else's challenge, but they don't have to go. Like, I have to go in and sit in an IV chair for three hours every four weeks, right? And I do work from there. And there's people out there that don't have a wife and kids, and they don't have any sort of challenges health-wise. And, and so that should maybe give them some confidence to go, you know what? I've got everything going for me, every reason why this can, why it can be successful. Yeah. Uh, great job with that. I mean, like people, I feel like, uh, <laughs> like we could let our stresses build and think that I feel like as our stress builds, we think like we are the most stressed out person on the planet. But if you look at like other situations, you realize that's not the case at all. I mean, when you look at uh, Sean's story, you hear other stories, oh, this isn't nearly as bad as I thought it would be. This is just uh, something that is here and it will pass eventually. Uh, so very interesting insight there um, because I feel like, again, a lot of people, like you don't want to fall into that trap where you feel like you're so stressed out and overwhelmed and then you look down at your ability to accomplish different things and you don't put in the work as much as you should. And when it comes to putting in the work, I believe in self-education. That's why... I host the Breakthrough Success podcast, but in addition, I also read a lot of books. So, Sean, I'm wondering if you could share with us three books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Well, let me think here. I obviously read the book Built to Sell before I sold my company. That to me is is so important. Um, you know, I, I'm always listening to podcasts. I think the great thing about me is when I'm driving around, when I'm traveling, when I'm doing stuff through my day, it gives me an opportunity. So. Obviously, books are important, and Built to Sell was something really uh, amazing for me as a person. Um, I also read The Wealthy Barber. Now, is it a business book? No, it's a financial book. But when I was 19 years old, I bought my first fourplex apartment building, and that's how I put myself to university. And it was that book that told me to start putting my $30 away a month, which gave me the money to buy that first fourplex back in my hometown. Um, obviously I had a, a nice little summer job and I did it with a high school friend that's, we bought it together, but <clears throat> excuse me, that book, um, really sort of set me on the path financially to know, you know, what a dollar's worth. My, my dad always says, you know, you worry about the nickels and dimes and the dollars will take care of themselves. And this book really reaffirmed that for me. Um, so um, I'd say those two books have really, uh, meant a lot. And obviously, you know, you've got your books like good to great. 
um, things like that. Um, you need to make sure that you personalize those books. Um, e myth. Um, I really like that book for processes. Um, I find a lot of people just sort of do stuff, um, in, in this world we have where, you know, I'm talking to you and there's all kinds of notifications coming up. And if you don't have processes in place, like how does your business run? How do you make sure that things are, are, you know, what happens for safety around the construction site? If you don't have processes in place to make sure that those things are happening automatically and the people that you have within the chain of command are following those things, then you're not going to be able to scale up and grow something that's really going to be worthwhile and sellable at some point, or even just successful in my opinion. Sean, thanks for sharing with us those great book recommendations. Those will all be in the show notes, markabardi.com slash E278. We'll also throw in Podcast Domination, which is my book, also available in audio form and audible. Uh, you can learn more about that at markabardi.com slash PD. And one of the things I'd like to explore a little bit more is you mentioned the fourplex. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your experiences with buying that fourplex, uh, the investing behind that. Uh, part of me asking this question is because I do want to look into real estate someday. So I'd really love to hear your thoughts on that experience. I had saved a bunch of money. I literally was one of those kids where I had jobs from when I was like five years old. Um, and I was always saving. It was a big deal for me. Um, I wasn't poor, but I would say we're sort of middle, middle class, maybe lower middle class. My dad was a minor. My mom was a stay at home mom and there's three boys. So I had an opportunity uh, I worked at the mine back home in my hometown when I was uh, about 18 and I saved a ton of money. And so I ended up deciding with a good high school and primary school friend that we we're going to try to buy a property and, and be landlords. And I went around to different properties with my dad and we ended up finding the right one. But it was from all the work I did before that. It was all the savings I did before that. And it was a real steep learning curve, you know, at 18 or 19. And I've always looked a little younger for my age. So when I went to the door to collect rent to introduce myself as a landlord, I, I wasn't looking 18. I was looking 15 years old. So um, and I remember going to the banks and trying to get them to give me a loan, uh, my friend Patrick and I. And they wanted my dad to co-sign. But this is something I thought was really important to do on my own. And I. I said to these bank managers, I said, listen, I'm 18 years old and I'm doing this now. Where am I going to be at 28 and 38? And if you guys don't take a chance on, on a guy like myself and, and my friend now, then I think you guys are giving up a really big opportunity. And they ended up doing that. Um, I was able to convince them that we were the guys to do it. And we bought the place and we owned it for a number of years and we ended up selling it. So um, it took a little bit of chutzpah, a little bit of, you know, talking to bank managers, but I think anybody can do that. Um, I've always known the difference between what a need and a want is. And I've always, a few minutes ago, I talked about that incremental every day, you know, doing a little bit on that to-do list. And I believe the same thing with saving the money to buy a property. It's that every day, a little bit on a to-do list. So um, with real estate, I've been involved with that since that point in time. And I've, I've had, uh, pretty good success. You know, there's been properties that haven't been as successful. Um, it's not like I have a, a magic uh, eight ball for this, but um, real estate will always do you well. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to talk to other people and asking people that maybe are in real estate to say, listen, can you mentor me? Can you take a moment to talk to me? Do you, is there anything that you can give to me that, that I'd be able to learn from. And most times people want to help other people. I, I remember there was a, a gentleman here up in, in Canada who was on Canada's version of the Shark Tank. And I called this guy and he's always been amazing, amazing to talk to, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of giving me advice. And um, he's the one who read, wrote, wrote The Wealthy Barber. And I wanted to meet with him and he was, he always told me how busy he was. And I said to him one day, I said, listen, I just want a, a little bit of your time. I said, I don't care if you're cleaning out your garage. I don't care if you're bagging leaves in your backyard. I will come here. I will do that for you. I'll do it with you. If you can just give me like 20 minutes of your time. And this sort of changed, um, 
the dynamic. He realized how sincere I was, and I wasn't just looking for him to just give me the secrets uh, to his success. He knew I was willing to, you know, get my hands dirty, literally, to uh, to get a little bit of his time. And that that's the kind of thinking you need to have to come up with. You can't just if you're going to call and ask somebody for for their help and their mentorship, know something about them, bring something to the table. What are they passionate about? I'm I'm a really great tennis player and instructor. Why don't I give you a, a lesson? Why don't why don't I give you a tennis lesson? We'll talk about this. Let me clean out your garage and maybe you can give me your two cents on real estate. So to, to answer a, your, your question with a long answer, that's, that's what I do. Get, get people to help you know who've got forgotten more than you even know about real estate. Sure. That's a really interesting approach to relationship building. I mean, I really like the idea of um, thinking of more ways to level up the interaction. I do appreciate the uh, insights on the real estate also because, I mean, I'm in a sim- similar situation, my age, my um, uh, my investing decisions, so things like that. So thank you for giving me the, and all of us those insights. Oh, yeah. and, uh, before we wrap up this episode, I'm wondering if, if you can share with us one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often. Hmm. I want to take time to think about this. I think it's what I said before, you know, you only get so many spins around this planet and there are some people who have to do jobs because they've got kids, they've got to support, they've got family, they've got a reasoning need to be doing something. And there's, there's that great video about um, Steve Jobs who got up every once in a while, look in the mirror and he asked himself, you know, is this what, if, if I wasn't going to be around a week from now, is this what I want to be doing? Is this the work I want to be doing? And if you have, some people don't have the choice to what they're doing. They're in a position, they, they haven't had the luck of the draw where they've got all these people around them and they're supporting them and helping them. But if you have that choice, are you where you want to be? And if you aren't where you want to be, and maybe you don't have that choice, where's that bridge? Where, where can you leap to get to where you want to be? And that goes back to Asking people around you for help, people will be there. So do I want to be doing what, I want, what I'm doing today? And secondly, who can help me to get to where I want to get to? Those are huge, huge questions that you should be asking daily, if not weekly. Sean, thank you for sharing with us those great questions and all of your great insights throughout our time together. If you guys want to learn more about Sean, check out the Reynolds <clears throat> Brothers Exteriors. Uh, you can find them online, and I know that Sean, is a few other places where uh, we can find him as well. Yeah, you can find me on uh, Twitter at uh, Sean Reynolds. Um, Sean dot Reynolds. Um, that's probably the best place, and I try to get back to everybody that reaches out to me. Sean, thank you for sharing with us uh, your Twitter. Thank you again for sharing all of your great insights with us. It was such a pleasure to have you on Breakthrough Success. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn.